And I believe, look, this message this morning, I want you to buckle in for a second, okay? Because it's, there's a weight to it. But I want to say this in the beginning. This is about joy. Yes. This is about freedom. There, there's a refreshing that God wants to give his people. Yes. And the title of my message is, There is Power in Repentance. Hallelujah. There is power in repentance. Okay, and sometimes we feel like that word of repentance is like this dirty word. Like, I'm a sinner. And, I, and, and, and yes, you know what? We are. And the sooner that we find that out, <laughs> the sooner that we recognize that I should be living a lifestyle of repentance. Right. My life should say, I repent of this way. I repent of that attitude. I repent of that thought process. I repent. I change directions. I ask for forgiveness. I, I, but I don't just stay there. Yeah. I look to the sacrifice. I look to the blood of Jesus. I want a change to take place in my heart and my mind. Because there's two different types of repentance. A, a, a godly repentance and a sorrowful repentance that is of this world. And I'm going to talk about both of those today. And I know we went long this morning and, and I love worshiping the Lord. And I feel like that was needful to set the tone for what I'm about to bring you. But I asked the Lord back there in my seat. I said, Lord, you want me to preach? It's 11 o'clock. Because you know how we do. And, and he said, preach my word. Hallelujah. Preach my word. So I'm going to do what he asked me to do. So if your belly's growling, just ask him to fill you spiritually till we can get to the lunch table. Second Corinthians 7.10. 2 Corinthians 7.10 7, and verse 11 says this. For godly sorrow produces repentance leading to salvation. Not to be regretted. You will not regret repenting. Yes. You will not be ashamed of repenting. You will not be sorrowful that you repented. <laughs> there it leads you to Christ. It leads you to the power of God. It leads you to divine grace reflected in your life. It leads you to freedom. It leads you to healing. Repentance is an avenue to get you to the power of God reflected in your life. Hallelujah. Repentance is a good thing. Yes. It's a good thing. It says it will not be regretted. But the sorrow of this world produces death. The next verse says, For observe this very thing, that you sorrowed in a godly manner. What diligence it produced in you. What clearing of yourself, what indignation, what fear, what vehement desire, what zeal, what vindication. In all things, you proved yourself to be clear in this matter. Paul wrote this book to, to the Corinthian church. And at the time, the culture of that time, they were dealing with prosperity and pleasure. And if you look at the culture today, that's what our world is all about. Right. It's all about power, prosperity in the natural and material things, and pleasure. Whatever makes me feel good, I'm going to do that. And actually, Paul was writing to the church. Yes. He's not talking to unbelievers. He's talking to the Corinthian church. So one thing I was talking to Pastor Matt about the other day, and I think Robert, was in the book of Revelations, he goes to the churches and he says, this, this, and this, I, you do well at. You, you're strong in, but I have this thing against you. And he goes to the next church and he says, this, this, and this, I encourage you in. You do well at, but this one thing I have against you. Repent and turn to your first love. Repent and turn back to me. So, Pastor Matt, once we, once we feel like we've arrived somewhere, we better check our heart. Especially in the church. We hide in the church. Because, you know, when we're out there doing what we want to do, we know that we sin. 
But we, when we're in the church house, it's good to put the Christian persona on and go through the motions and don't think that we have anything to be repented of. But when we feel like we don't have anything to be repented of, you better start repenting of not repenting. Because then we feel like we're some superiority. We have some spiritual superiority. And, and the Corinthians, in the second Corinthians, that's what they were dealing with. Spiritual superiority. And they were dealing with divisions in the church, lawsuits in the church, sexual immorality in the church and confusion about food and about worship and about different laws and different things and Paul came to the church to say you need to repent Hallelujah! he didn't go to the world because the world already needs to repent yes. he came to the church and he said look even though Christ has come and has been crucified and shed his blood for you you still need to live a life of repentance. It's not once saved, always saved, church. Come on. There's, there's an avenue we can go down that we become in a backslidden state and we can walk away from the Lord. Come on. That's right. We can have something separating us. Sin separates us from the presence of God. Sin separates us from the glory of God. Sin separates us from Him. Not just the initial sin. Sin in our walk with God. And God is calling us closer. Hallelujah. He said, I want to remove everything that is in the way of me and you. And I want you to come closer. Yeah. And I feel like that's what he's saying. And he's not saying, look, it's not to be condemned. Yeah. Yes, sin is to be condemned. But the verdict over your life is not condemnation yeah. Yeah. to those who believe. It's justification. Yes. You are not guilty because of the blood of Jesus. Amen. But you don't want to live in a guilty state. You don't want to rebel against God and walk that way. Because when you walk that way and you don't repent of it, he allows sin to become exceedingly sinful in hopes that you would repent and we would return to him. Yes. See, and, and I love... I actually love repentance, Pastor Matt, because there's a clearing. Yes. There's a cleansing. Hallelujah. There's a peace. Yes. I, t I told Pastor Matt, I told him of a situation. Um, I was in Bible college. You know, everybody in Bible college is perfect, right? <laughs> Not. <laughs> and when I was in Bible college, I was dealing with this certain situation that I kept going back to. Yes. And I was the girl's dorm leader. I was the leader. I was supposed to be like this. And you know what? When you think you're something, God will show you that you're not there. No <laughs> and I kept going back to this certain situation. And the Lord showed me this, that I was frustrating the grace of God. Have y'all ever had a straw and you try to suck through it? And it, it, so when it fir at first, it's a nice flow, right? But then when it gets that hole in the side of it, you know how it gets pinched and then and the liquid starts to flow out the side of it and you're not getting the fullness of what you're supposed to be drinking right. and you're like, you get frustrated like why, why am I because there's a hole in it and that's what we do as believers when we keep going back to something that God doesn't want us to hold on to or Come we on. keep holding on to something that God is telling us to let go, then we're frustrating the grace of God and we're not getting the fullness of his grace we're not getting the fullness of his power but let me tell you, I told Pastor Matt this I'm putting myself out there because I'm not perfect I said Pastor Matt, every time I would go to minister I'm going to tell you all this story don't, don't hold this against me I'm justified. God, I would go to minister. I knew that that situation would hold me back. So I would be like, well, I'm not going to do that no more. I'm not going to deal with that person no more. And I would go and preach and the power of God would move. And then two days later, I would end back in the same position. Frustrating the grace of God. Come on, y'all don't act like your angels are going to show up at church and say, oh, we're going to repent today. And then Monday morning, here we are, back in the same situation. Frustrating the grace of God. And I got to one point where I said, God, look, I cannot. And it was a two-year battle. This wasn't like an overnight thing. Like, and every time I would go back to the situation, I could 
feel the grace of God being removed. Mm. I could feel it. I had no power over that thing. Because God was saying, submit and yield and surrender that thing. And as soon as I would, I would test it, y'all. I would go to prayer and be like, I give it to you. And then I felt the peace of God. And then I, as soon as my heart, and not the action, my heart would say, I want, I want that thing. I could feel God saying, no, nope, no, nope, no, nope, that's not, no. Nope. And I could feel the grace of God being removed a little bit. He did it not because he's a harsh God. He wanted me to recognize that is not me. <laughs> that is not for you. That is not me. And then as soon as I would surrender and repent, the peace of God would come. The joy of God would come. Even though there was a death like Sabrina was talking about taking place, I could feel the joy of the Lord delivering me. I could feel I had been loosed. I've been set free. Well, Danielle running around here because she has a jubilee. She knows exactly what God has done in her life. Look, you should be running with her. Yes. Look, I should be running with her. Okay, because there's a joy. Look, and if you're like, Man, I just don't understand that yet. Start singing it. Yes. <laughs> just break out. Yes. Start praising. And I tell you, the presence of God will start to make you somebody you don't recognize. Hallelujah. I mean, I've seen Jessica down here. Where's she at? Oh, she's teaching the kids. I've seen a joy on Jessica's face yes. that I don't think I've ever seen before. Hallelujah. And she was excited. Yeah. about God moving on her pan at the altar. Yeah. I mean, I'm talking about God will do something different in you. Yeah. I mean, where's Michelle? Is she in here still? Michelle got filled with the Holy Ghost. That's a game changer right yeah. there. I mean, and I can see it in her countenance. She feels the joy of the Lord falling fresh on her. Why? Because we've repented. Yeah. We've repented. A message of condemnation. I'm telling you, repent. Yes. <laughs> Change directions. Yes. Let that thing go. Hallelujah. Let that mindset go. Let that attitude go. Yes. Whatever God is telling you to do, let it go. Because it's keeping you captive yes. from the joy and the peace of God that wants to encapsulate your heart and your mind. I mean, I'm telling you, there's nothing like repentance. Yes. There is nothing like God wants to change you this morning. And God said, I want to call you to a lifestyle of repentance. I want to call you to a lifestyle of separation. God reminded me, so I'm here this weekend. Naya left me. She she didn't come see me this weekend. Just telling you. And my, and my husband didn't come either. And I was sitting there like, wow, Lord, pretty lonely. And God reminded me of the times that I spent with him Hallelujah. that was just me and him. Jesus. The times that he did something in me that was just me and him. Yes. And uh, I, Nye has good reason. My husband has good reason. But <laughs> you know that loneliness that will set in your heart yes. and try to get you to, you know, be busy doing stuff and whatever. God said, Angela, it's okay to be alone with me. Hallelujah. Because I'm separating. Hallelujah. I, it's okay. Look, when God starts to remove stuff from your life, it is painful. Not you. <laughs> it, it is painful when God does a separation. Because there's a death that takes place, but there's always a resurrection. Yeah. <laughs> there's a death that takes place, but there's always a resurrection. So God wants to do a separating in your heart and in your mind. He says, I'm calling you to singleness. I'm not talking about singleness if you're married to someone right now. I'm talking about a singleness of the heart. Hallelujah. I'm talking about a singleness of the mind. Singleness means to set, to keep apart, to set aside for a specific purpose, to sever an association with. There's something, there's a severing going on. That God wants you to not associate with something. Mm. 
Mm. He doesn't. Association means you have a relationship with that thing. Come on. I'll tell you what. I had a. Real, I talked to Pastor Matt about this yesterday. I'm seeing God work in my marriage in a different way that I never thought. Hallelujah. And God started the work when I decided to stop trying to prove myself to my husband. Hallelujah. I took, just trying to prove. Prove that I'm a woman and I know the word of God. And da, 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 da. Look, that's a godly thing. That's like, like I'm trying to prove that I know something. Come on. And, and God said, Angela, just be quiet. <laughs> <laughs> that's not, that, tell a preacher to be quiet and see what happens. <laughs> but in the quietness and the stillness, God began to develop something. In my marriage and in my husband Hallelujah. and in me, Hallelujah. that if I kept trying and opening up my mouth and trying to prove myself, otherwise wouldn't happen. Amen. That's good. See, when God asks you to do something that is against your nature, <laughs> trust him Amen. and let him develop. He told me, he said, Angela, all I want you to do is just pray. Just pray. There's a situation that goes on. I, I wanted to speak on it. He said, no, don't speak on that. Just pray. Just pray. And in your prayer closet, there's a separation that is taking place. And a trust in God that you only got to trust him to do the work. Because he's the only one that can do the work. Anyway. And he wants to talk to you about a, that you're not shared with another. Even our children, our spouse, our best friends. Your heart is singleness of my, let me tell you, I would have stayed with Naya for the rest of my life, traveled the world, did all these things, and when God called me to Meridian, there was a death that took place. And I'm telling you that to say, when, the, when a separation takes place, he's saying, I want you solely for my purpose and my will, but we might not understand it at the time. We might not even understand what he's doing at the time. And he just gives one step and one step and one step. And, and, but he's saying, you're solely mine. I want you to associate with only me, only my will for your life. Yeah. Look, my will, me and I would have been traveling the world together. That was my will. <laughs> and we can still do that. <laughs> God. Hallelujah. Okay. But that, but our will may not necessarily be his will for our life. And I have to, and you have to surrender that thing and allow him to separate you. Allow him to sever whatever it is you're associating with. Singleness of mind, singleness of heart, separated solely. Jeremiah 32, 38 through 40 says this. They shall be my people. I will be their God. Then I will give them what? One heart and one way that they may fear me forever. For the good of them, listen, they may fear me, they may reverence me, they may be in awe of me forever. For what? The good of them. And the good, it says, of their children and their children after them. That we may leave a legacy of repentance and an inheritance for our children and our children's children for the good of them. But it starts with a singleness of heart. He says, and I will make an everlasting covenant with them. And I will not turn them away from doing good. But I will put fear in their hearts so they do not depart from me. Not a fear like I'm terrified of God. A reverence. Yes. That God is holy and that God is just and that see, he sees all things and he knows our thoughts and he knows our intents of heart and he knows because he fashioned and formed us in our mother's womb and he knows the direction that we're going and what we desire and there's a fear there that we want to do right by God because he died for us on Calvary. See, that's where we should be. Oh, you shed your blood for me. Yeah. I want to do right by you. I want to do it because I love you. Yes. Yes. yes Lord. I want to serve you because you first loved me and gave yourself for me. Yes. Not this terrified all of God. Like, I got to run.
run away from him. Stop running from him. Run to yeah. him. Run to him because he wants to give you power to overcome whatever it is that is hindering you from being closer to him. He says, I will be their God and I will be good to them. My husband said to me, I realize that, that living on this earth is for one thing, for our good and his glory. That's it. For our good and his glory. He's just opening that to him more and more. It's for our good, even in the pain. It's for our good and for his glory. And Sabrina shared that with her testimony this morning. That word, fear me, means that you're going to stand in reverence of him all the days of your life. Proverbs 9.10 says the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. If you want to be wise, if you want to have good sense and good judgment and discernment and insight, we need to fear God and his word and take it for what it is. Don't cherry pick the word of God. Me and my husband were talking about this the other day. He was saying, man, these people are living this way, but all that comes out of their mouth is stuff about the Lord. Hallelujah. But I'm seeing this lifestyle. And I said that's because they're picking and choosing from the word of God what they want to believe about God. I, I Well, this is okay, and that is okay. I want this from the Lord and that from the Lord, but I want to choose not to believe this. But there are consequences yeah. that will come because they chose to not believe the fullness of the word that's of right. God. You have fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Then it says this, Philippians 2.12. Wherefore, my beloved Christians, as you have obeyed, not just in my presence. Paul's saying, look, don't just obey. Look, don't come to church and obey in front of Pastor Matt. Come on. This is what Paul is saying. You have obeyed, not just in my presence. But now, much more in the absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. Hallelujah. Work out your own salvation. See, don't just do right in front of men. God sees all things. He knows all things. We were driving down the street, and my nine-year-old boy, Ezra, he goes, he was talking about a situation, and he said, Daddy, well, don't do that. Miss Angie's not around. You're not going to be around. <laughs> and, and Jeff turns around and goes, well, why, why wouldn't I do it right Jeff, just because Miss Angie's not around? He said, and, it, and he asked Ezra, he said, Ezra, do you, do you lie when I'm not around? Do you cheat when I'm not around? Do you cuss when I'm not around? Do you watch things you're not supposed to when I'm not around? And Ezra said, no. And he said, well, why? Why do you do that? He said, well, because it's right. I just do what's right. And Jeff said, so I don't need Miss Angie to do what's right. I do what's right because it's right. And because God says that it's right. And God is always there. And the Holy Spirit is always there. Yeah. So look, I'm telling you, and, I, and look, I'm guilty of it. There's been times that I, I've done just what was right because Naya said, Angela, you shouldn't do that. Help us, Amen. Or somebody said, I shouldn't do that. So here comes Pastor Matt, and I changed the channel on the TV. <laughs> come on, come on. My, my children are guilty of that. I'll listen from the outside of the door. <laughs> but I'll tell you this story. So I went to get my car tag, and I only listen to worship music. And when the kids are with me, they only listen to worship music. So, but they hear other music elsewhere. So when I got, when I go inside, they had worship music on. And here I come outside and you hear the bumping coming out of my car. And I was like, oh Lord. So I walk up and as soon as I open the car door, they switch the music. And I said, what y'all listening to? This? They say this, what the, music, the worship music that was on. I said, oh, okay. And I left it alone. I look, the Lord yes, yes. will sometimes leave us to our own devices 
to see if we're going to repent. And listen, what is in darkness will always come to light. So we driving down the street, and, and I have this screen, and Ezra goes to recently played to go back to another song he wanted to find. And then it says, like the third one down says, such and such of so-and-so, and I don't even know the name because I don't even know who's out there anymore. And I said, oh, 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 hold on. What's that? Right there. And he said, it's just, I said, what I tell you about listening to that kind of music in my car. We don't listen to that kind of music. So anyway, I say all that to say God knows how to reach us. And God knows how to reveal things. And look, I didn't scold Ezra and tear him down. I No, I reminded him what God wants to do in his life. And what can take from him if he allows things to get into his heart, into his mind. And listen, these kids nowadays, they ain't listening to like some frilly like love music or whatever. They're listening to like some hardcore yeah. like drugs, sex, yeah. pornography. That I mean, it's it's not good. That's and you right. know what? They're so naive that they just listen to the beat. Yeah. Come on. I mean, I ask, I'll ask them all the time when something's on. I don't know why I got on this kick. I'm sorry, but I, I God, I ask them all the time. I'm saying, what are they saying? Yeah, that's it. And and they'll be like, I don't know. <laughs> they really don't know. That's right. But it's getting in their spirit. That's right. And my job as a watchman and as a parent is to be like, I'm not letting that in my child's spirit because you know what? It's hard enough as an adult. Christian should be one solely mine, sold out for 
for God. Single-minded, single-focused. That's how we can travel to all different churches that love Jesus and feel right at home. Yes. There, I mean, I have traveled to Boston, to, to California, all over the place. I have been with different cultures. One time, Nia and I went to this African church, and I was like the only white person there. And you know what? I felt right at home. Wow. You know why? Because the Spirit of God was in that yeah. place. Like, it's one mind, one body, one soul purpose. And when we are sold out like that, there's, a, there's one way. Yeah. And I love that about the body. I mean, for real. Where else can you get that? That's right. That's right. Everything's always separated and That's segregated right. and, and, and clickish. And, but in the body of Christ, I'm, I mean, come on. You don't know everybody that's in this place, but if you see somebody at the altar, you coming up to pray for them, and the Spirit of God begins to move on the both of you like you've known each other all your life. Come on. Miss Brenda, we don't talk that much, but she's come up to me and prayed for me and read my complete mail. Don't know me at, at all. Don't know what's going on in my life. That's the spirit of God. Yeah. That's what, I love that about the Lord. Fall in love with Jesus. Yeah. And the way that he moves and the way that he works in his people. Hallelujah. For this is the whole duty of man. A call to separation. Do not be unequally yoked with unbelievers. This is Corinthians 6, 14, 18. He sets the precedence for repentance in this way. A call to separation. Do not be unequally yoked with unbelievers. For the, what fellowship does righteousness have with lawlessness? What communion does light have with darkness? Paul is saying, do not be unequally yoked. A yoke is something that goes around the neck of an ox and a donkey. It's a wooden frame that connects two animals together, yoked together, linked together, joined together, tied together, a type of marriage. Do not be unequally yoked with unbelievers. That doesn't mean a segregation or a complete, but don't go in the same direction that they're going. Don't have the same mindset that the world is having. Don't go that way. Don't be yoked and tied to them. It's time to separate from that. And I thought about this. If it was a wooden thing that tied the yoke and the, the ox and the donkey together, it was the cross oh. that tied us to Jesus. Yeah. That tied us. To, that is the yoke. Take my yoke upon you. Take my yoke upon you for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. He wants us to be yoked and tied to him. And you can't be yoked to Christ and yoked to the world at the same time. You can't be yoked to Christ and yoked to a certain mindset at, at the same time. He's saying, my light can't dwell in darkness. He shines his light to remove the darkness. And sometimes we, I, man, when I first started serving the Lord, I would literally feel like, oh, Holy Spirit, would you just leave me alone? <laughs> and I say that with all respect. But I felt like that because it was every little thing. The Lord, I mean, he was working. He was working. I was like, this is overdrive, Lord. Like, oh, my goodness. But that was because I wanted to, I was sensitive towards the Lord, and I wanted to be sensitive to the Lord. And But I felt like I was under a microscope. And I was. The Holy Ghost was like, like zooming in on things in my life. And he was like, okay, don't talk like that. Don't, don't roll your eyes at her. Don't, you know, you know what I'm talking about? Don't think like that. I'm like, you're all you're in my thoughts. Like, oh my goodness. I need a break. Hallelujah. Do it. Now, Lord. Know what I'm comfort that comes and there's a peace that comes and there's a clearing that comes and there's a cleansing that comes when we begin to actually open up our heart to him and it's a relationship here you go Lord but look, look Angela mm -mm, don't you throw up your hands at that woman as you're driving down the street <laughs> she might be at your church next week <laughs> y'all know what I'm talking about all of a sudden that person you gave a finger to walks in the door <laughs> y'all know <laughs> repent <laughs> change my ways God yes. change the way that I think change my frustrations 
Change how easily offended I am. Come on. Change my pride and me thinking that I got it together and I'm better than. I mean, come on. Now look, even in spiritual things, we can be like, oh, prayer life. We got our prayer life. Come on. We pray in the heavens down. <laughs> and then somebody come in and say, help. Well, guess what? Your prayer ain't any better than theirs. God is hearing. God is hearing both hearts. Do not judge somebody else's salvation. Do not judge somebody else's relationship with the Lord. Look, there was a day I didn't know who Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John were. I had to start somewhere. Look, when you walk into the gym, this is one thing that I see a lot. We will, I've seen people do this and it really frustrates my soul. A heavier set person walks into the gym and a person that's been fit for years looks at them a certain way. Like everybody's got to start somewhere. I'm the kind of person that I'm like, yeah, girl, get it. Yes. I go up to them. I'm like, yeah, you get it. You need help. What you need? How can I help you to get where you want to be? And that's what we should be like in the church. When that person walks in the door and you see them out on the street and they smell and they don't look like you look like and they ain't talking your lingo and they still got some things going on, you better go up to them and be like, yeah, get it. Get Jesus. Because you know what? We weren't always there. Encourage them on their repentance and then repent of your superiority of feeling like you're better than. That's what we need. Repentance in the church. Yeah. I always tell, I told my husband, I said, I'm going to say sorry to the kids. You know why? Because I want them to know that I don't have it all together. And that I am wrong at times. And I will teach them through saying that I'm sorry that it's okay to repent. And it's okay to make things right. And it's okay to say I don't have it all together. I don't know. Love the Lord thy God. Separate. Have no fellowship with the lies and the deception and the death of this world. There is, I'm going to tell you this, there is no such thing as going in two directions. There isn't. Matthew 12, 25 says, And Jesus knew their thoughts and said unto them, Every kingdom divided. That means they were giving a portion to another. Against itself is brought to what? Desolation. Is brought to waste. In every city and house that is divided against itself shall not stand. He's saying if your heart at any place is given to another, then you will not stand. That to me is a sobering thought. It's a reverencing thought towards the Lord. God, is there anything in me? God, is there anything that is not solely sold out to you? Because if there is, I do not want to be a Christian that is divided. I want to stand. I want my house, my temple to stand. I want my heart to stand. I want my family to stand. God. If there's any wicked way in me, show me that I can give it to you. There is no basis for sharing fellowship, righteousness with rebellion. There's no fellowship between righteousness and rebellion. Yielding yourself to the Holy Spirit means you give yourself over to. You, you give way to the Holy Spirit to do what he wants to do in you. You yield to him. And lawlessness means you have no restraint, no self-control, no boundaries at all. God is saying, look, righteousness and truth does not have fellowship with someone or something or some way of life that has no boundaries, no restraint. They cannot go together. And I love this. My friend Hillary called me. She said, you won't believe what happened at my son's um, presentation today. I said, what? She said, he's six years old. She said, they were doing the fruit of the spirit. And they asked him, Tyler, what is the hardest fruit of the spirit? And he screams at the top of his lungs, self-control. <laughs> While he has no 
no self-control, screaming it at the top of his lungs. But I began to think about that as an adult. Come on, when somebody gets you upset, what is coming out of our mouth? Help us, And I'm, you don't even gotta be saying it to them, you might be saying it to your friend. Come on. And you might not even, you might be so holy that you're not saying it to your friend, but you're saying it inside. Come on. That's good right there. And God is saying, hold on, separate from that. That attitude, that thought process, that way that would lead you. See, when we get like that, that's going to lead us to resentment and bitterness and unforgiveness. And there's going to be a separation of the body of Christ. And then when there's a separation here, there's a separation here. And God is saying, no, I don't want you to have any fellowship with that way. Yes. Don't fellowship with that. You want to yield towards the Holy Spirit. Then he says, what communion has light with darkness? Meaning what partnership or participation does light have with darkness? You should not be participating in anything that God says we should not be participating in. It says in Ephesians 5, 8, for you were sometimes in darkness, but now, but now you are children of light of the Lord. Walk, walk as children of light. Order your lifestyle as someone that walks in the light. And I'm telling you, but I love the Holy Spirit because he will show us when we're walking in an area of darkness. And when he shows us and we see it, we yield, we repent, and we receive power to overcome that thing. See, and that's what I love about the Lord. Once I started understanding the cross and understanding the blood of Jesus and understanding every little minute detail that he was showing me wasn't to condemn me or make me feel bad about myself. Because that's what the enemy will do. The enemy will, will, as soon as the Holy Spirit shows you something, the enemy will zone in on that thing and condemn you. And make you feel guilty, guilty, guilty. You're too far gone. You're too far lost. You too, you're, no, see, you're never going to be a good enough Christian. No, I'm never going to be a good enough Christian. Because Jesus paid it all. All to him I owe. Yeah. No, I'm not. But he's changing me and he's perfecting me and he and he's glorifying himself in me and he's changing me and he's perfecting me. I don't have to live under the verdict of guilty any longer. I can live under the verdict of free and victorious and forgiven. See, that's why we gotta know who we are and know what repentance actually gives us. As soon as we see the conviction of the Holy Ghost, Repent of that thing. Yield to him. Change directions. And allow the power of God to change you. Yeah. And one day you're going to look back and say, I don't even think like that anymore. That's good. You're going to look back and say, I don't even want to do that anymore. Man, man, they cut me off. And I just rested in peace. I'm not even mad anymore. I mean, I have to pay this bill, and I'm just trusting the Lord. I'm not even moved anymore. I mean, God will begin to do such a work that you will have such a rest in your heart, and there will be there won't be that battle between the flesh and the spirit anymore. I mean, it's a continuous process. It's a continuous work. But I feel as we begin to understand what God's doing, Proverbs says, in all things, get understanding. And as we begin to get understanding of how God moves and works at times, there's a peace that can come with that. Because we know that he has our best interest in mind. Amen. And we know that, that he is good and that he is right. Amen. And when we know that, we can rest in it. He begins to say, and what agreement does the temple of God have with idols? For you are the temple of the living God, and God has said, I will dwell in them, I will walk in them, I will be their God, and they shall be my people. We should have, as the temple of the Holy Spirit, no agreement with idols. That means nothing shall come before the Lord. Nothing at all. Him and him alone shall come first. Our lives should be yielded completely to him. And when we don't understand it, 
Trust him. You know, bad company corrupts good morals. And when other people are living a certain lifestyle, God keeps saying, be separate. Yes. God keeps saying, have no agreement with. Yes. God keeps saying, have no communion with. Yes. Do not participate with that. Why? He's warning us because bad company corrupts good morals. And you know what? The company could be right in here. What company are we keeping in our mind? I'm not even talking about friendships. I'm talking about who's sitting at the table in your mind. Is self-pity there? Is resentment there? Is unforgiveness there? Is anger there? Is bitterness there? Is sexual immorality there? Who's sitting at your table? What kind of communion are we having? Is pride there? Is spiritual pride there? Is religion at our table? Who's who's at our table? Who are we having communion with? Because God is saying, have no agreement with idols. This is where my spirit dwells. And then he says this, Wherefore, come out from among them, depart, escape from them, and be separate, saith the Lord. Touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you. There's a condition. I've never seen this before, Pastor Matt. But he's saying, in order for me to receive you, you must separate yourself from the unclean thing. Now look. God is not a harsh taskmaster, but he also doesn't wink at sin. Come on, sister. Preach it. So he's saying, if you are in the process of believing me and yielding to me and submitting to me and I'm working, I will receive you as you continually separate yourself from that which is not of me. But if you intently rebel after I reveal the truth to Come you. On. Truth revealed in unrighteousness, light revealed, light will be removed. So he's saying, I won't receive you mm. if you continue to walk in the wrong direction. That's right. Now that's not to me. That's not for me to decide when he decides what is what and when you do what. But he said, but he said he said, those who are separate and touch not. And I've been, I, that word means stop touching. Mm. Stop touching the unclean thing. Yes. And I started to think about how in the new covenant, he not only tells you don't commit adultery, but he says don't even think yes. it, don't even look at it. Yes. So that touching starts in your heart yes. before it manifests in the body. So you could be touching something in your heart and nobody know it come on, and coming in the church house Let's preach you right there. and doing all the hallelujahs, paying my tithes, come on. doing all these activities. I even serve in the youth. I do all these things, but I'm in my heart touching that thing. Yeah. That can be hard. That can be hard. I was like, oh God. Help me touch not that unclean thing. Right. And look, when God begins to clean us up in, in the church, usually we get to this point where like, okay, for myself, I just use myself as an example. I don't lie anymore. I mean, I got it. I look, I was a liar. I could have made you believe the sky was blue. It is blue. <laughs> <laughs> I could have made you believe the sky was red. I mean, that's how... In depth of my lying, there was. He got rid of my lying. He got rid of my cheating. He got rid of my stealing. He got rid of. He got rid of my drugs. He got rid of. He got rid of all these things, and that's great. Look, I'm not down in that at all. I mean, I was addicted to heroin. He got rid of that. Oh, I mean, he, I mean, he set me free. I've been clean 13 years. He set me free. But he said he wanted to do a deeper work. Than Come that. on. I mean, he wanted to go deep in my heart because look, those outward. He, 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 God actually can clean them things up pretty quickly if we yield to him. Yes. 
Okay, I said if. Hear me. If we yield to him. There's a conditional clause. If we yield to him. Okay? But then he's like, all right, so now you 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 are churchified. Mm. Now we're gonna go deep. Come on. Now we go into the motives and the intent of your heart. Oh, that's so good. Now we go into why you do things. Yeah. Now we're going to your complaining and your pride. Come on. And your jealousy. Mm-hmm. Now we're going to go deep to, to why you did drugs. Mm. Let's, let's get it at the root yes. of the pain. That you 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 have from your childhood or or whoever hurt you. Let's get to the root of the matter. Come on, sister. See, God wants to go deep in us. That's right. Hallelujah. God so said. Good. So good. Thank you. Therefore, having these prom- promises, beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. 2 Corinthians 7, 1. Therefore, therefore, I'm calling you to a separation that leads to a cleansing. See, God isn't going to just leave you at the separate part and leave you with that. Now he wants to cleanse. And he said, from all filthiness. Therefore, meaning because we have these promises, Paul starts off this chapter Boasting in the Lord. Boasting in his promises. A statement of excessive pride and thankfulness. Not pride in a bad way. Pride and thankfulness towards the Lord. He says, therefore having these promises. Thank you, God, for your goodness. Thank you, God, for your grace. Thank you, God, for your power. Thank you, God, for salvation. Thank you, God, for your healing. Thank you, God, for deliverance. Thank you, God, that you are my father. Thank you, God. Thank you, Jesus. He begins to boast because I have promises of God. Because of this thing, he looks to the goodness of God that leads man to repentance. He looks to Jesus and he says, because of this, cleanse yourself. Because I love you, because Jesus loves you, cleanse yourself. And he said, this is our conditional sanctification. Cleansing of our actions, our deeds, our words. It is our responsibility to separate ourselves from uncleanness of the world and its system and idolatry. We have an obligation to disregard all external filthiness and all internal pollution. Listen, we can become polluted. That word polluted means an environment unsuitable and unsafe. We, our hearts, can be an environment that is unsuitable for the Lord. That is unsafe because we have allowed and introduced waste of harmful materials into our environment. And he's saying, I want to not, you're not to have a polluted mindset, not to have a polluted heart. I want you to collect, cleanse yourself. That word perfecting holiness means to bring into a state of completion. When you are satisfied with Christ, you're not constantly looking for the next thing. God makes us complete and whole in him. I am complete in Christ. He says, open your hearts to us, Paul says. Meaning, don't turn a, a deaf ear to the spirit. We have wronged no one. We have corrupted no one. We have cheated no one. Paul saying, look, I'm asking you to cleanse yourself and come to truth. And I want you to know that there's false teachers leading people in the wrong direction. But I am not one of them. And I am telling you, cleanse yourself and come to Jesus. I have led no one in the wrong way, Paul was saying. And he's saying, look, separate yourself. Cleanse yourself by the power of the Holy Spirit. And receive power of repentance. 2 
2 Corinthians 7, 10 for says, For godly sorrow produces repentance, leading to salvation, not to be regretted, but the sorrow of this world produces death. Godly sorrow is sorrow initiated by the conviction of the Holy Spirit. The conviction is the act or the process of a person finding themselves guilty of a crime in a court of law. In God's courtroom, we see whatever that thing is, that this has made me guilty. And the Holy Spirit convinces me of my error. Yes, right. There are things in our life, two, three, four, five years ago, that if the Holy Spirit convicted me of it then, I might have not have seen it. Yes. And now, he has convinced me of my error. Yes. That's called growth. Yes. That's to be excited. Something 10 years ago when I first got saved, I mean, I was just trying to get off drugs. Forget about everything else. I was convicted of the drugs. <laughs> and then through the process of sanctification and change, as I continued to believe him and, and wash in his word and in worship and in my prayer life and cultivate a relationship with him, now I see things I did 10 years ago, 12 years ago, 13 years ago when I got saved, I don't do them today. Ways that I thought back then were still okay, I don't think that way today. Because there's a continuous perfecting and it making me complete and whole in Christ. And that's not to be regretted. That's encouraging your relationship with the Lord. And he says that the Holy Spirit will compel you to admit the truth. When we come in line with the truth of God's word, we says, say that what he says is truth. So if I'm convicted of lying and he says, thou shalt not lie, I come in line with his word that says, I don't want to be a liar anymore. I want to be a woman of integrity and I want to be a woman of honor and I want to be a woman of truth. And I want to be a woman that keeps my word. And when I say what I mean, I mean what I say. And my yes is yes and my no is no. God did that. Yes. God's doing that. Yes. And if I ever begin to backslide in my heart, because it starts in the heart, he will convict me of that. Yes. And he will make me to admit that I am wrong. Yes. And that I need his divine power and grace to change that yes. thing. And he will. Yes. Godly sorrow works, produces a lifestyle of repentance. That is a present tense verb. It's an action word. Repentance is an action word. It's not just saying, I'm sorry. And repentance is not deliverance. We need to repent, change directions, and walk believing, and walk trusting and walk yielding and walk giving and submitting to the Lord and receiving the power of his spirit to overcome the thing he's telling you to repent of yeah. or need to repent of and it leads us continuously in an attitude of life that leads to salvation that leads to deliverance that leads, look, we don't need to just be saved once. Come on. <laughs> and I don't mean the act of being born again. Yes. You're born again once. But then you need to be saved from yourself. Yes. I need to be saved yes. from myself. Yes. I need to be saved from the world. True. It's getting more wicked and more wicked right. and more wicked as we go. I need to be saved from the lies and the tactics and the schemes of the enemy. I need to be saved. Yes. Continuously saved from self and separated to God. This is a, not to be regretted. You will not be sorry that you repented. Jesus. For the sorrow of this world produces death. That's a self-centered sorrow that I'm only sorry because I got caught. I'm only sorry because your sin found you out. I'm only 
only sorry because there's consequences to my sin. I'm not worried about the word of God. I'm not worried about the Father's heart. I'm not even worried about sin. I'm just worried that other people see that I got home. That's a worldly sorrow. And that sorrow only produces death. One sorrow brings us deeper into our relationship with the Lord and the reality of salvation and our benefits of, in Christ. And the other one brings us deeper into a spiritual death. And there are a couple people, and I'm going to close, that I want to give examples of. A godly sorrow. King David was a man after God's own heart. He seen God move in his life. He seen his, he was anointed at the age of 13. He seen he was anointed to kill a bear, to kill a lion. He was anointed to kill Goliath. He was anointed to kill the Philistines. He was protected from an attack of Saul on his life that Saul wanted him dead. He became king and seen the promises of God come to pass. But there was one day that he didn't join the battle. There was one day that he wasn't in the fight of faith. And he seen Bathsheba bathing on a rooftop. Listen, the moment he laid eyes on Bathsheba, he should have repented. He should have departed. He should have turned away. He had that moment that he should have repented, but instead he called Bathsheba over. As soon as she showed up on the doorstep, he could have shut the door to that sin. He, should have, he could have been like, nope. But he allowed the sin in. And then not only did he commit this act of adultery, but then he tried to cover it up. And when he began to go cover it up, listen, the Holy Spirit won't leave you alone. I, I can, I can kind of like put it in my heart and my mind through the way the Lord has worked with me over time that like the conviction of the Holy Spirit was probably there. And you can, look, you can shut the mouth of the Holy Spirit just like you can shut the mouth of the devil. You know, I, I gave y'all an example before of that decline button on the phone and how we should decline the advances of the devil. Well, there's times in our life if we want something bad enough, we can decline the advances of the Holy Spirit. And I feel like that's what, what King David was doing. Kind of just, no, nope, I just want this. This, I, I, I want this. And he was captivated by that thing. And then he even killed Uriah. And it took Nathan showing up and saying, you have sinned. Against God. And you know what? King David showed godly repentance. He said, hide thy face from my sins and blot out thy iniquities. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit from within me. Cast me not away from thy presence and take not thy Holy Spirit from me. Restore unto me the joy of thy salvation and uphold me with thy right spirit. David in the Old Testament was looking to the coming Redeemer and was looking to the blood of Jesus already in the Old Testament. Amen. He knew whom he served and he knew he served a God of forgiveness. He served a God of grace. He knew who he served and he called on his God and said, take this sin away from me. Blot it out and clean my heart. He had a godly sorrow. He had a sorrow that produced change to salvation. Peter was a disciple who followed Jesus, who left his livelihood, who was the spokesperson for Jesus, who was in his inner circle. I'm telling you, church we can make some mistakes Peter walked on water but God told him you will deny me three times and when the, the rooster crows you'll know that you have denied me and Peter thought it could never be so I would never deny you Lord and then he began to curse and swear saying I don't know this man and immediately the rooster crowed. And Peter remembered the words of Jesus and said unto him, When the rooster crows, thou shalt deny me three times. And he went out and he wept bitterly. God had told him, Satan has come you to sift you as wheat, but I pray your faith not fail. But when you're converted, when you're changed in your heart, strengthen the brethren. He knew Peter was going to do wrong and he was saying, Look, keep the faith. Keep the faith. Keep the faith, and I'm going to change you in your heart and lead you unto salvation. And you know what happened? 3,000 people got saved. 3,000 people got baptized with the Holy Ghost. Because
because Peter was converted in his heart and had a godly sorrow and desire change that led to his salvation and the salvation of others. We want that lifestyle of repentance. But I want to talk about this real quick as we, as we close. Worldly sorrow that produces death. The rich young ruler enthroned with greed. An intense desire for money, wealth, and power. He went to Jesus and said, how must I have life? And Jesus said, believe me and keep thy commandments. And the rich young ruler said, I have not murdered. I have not committed adultery. I, I have not stolen. I have not bared false witness from my youth. I have not done any of these things. And Jesus said, good. You have not done any of those things. But he said this. Jesus said unto them, if it will be perfect, if you are being complete in Christ, go and sell what you have and give to the poor, and thou shalt have a treasure in heaven. Come and follow me. He's calling him to himself. But when the young man heard, that he touched on that very thing that the rich young ruler wanted. He went away sorrowful, sorrowful. So he, for he had great possessions. And Jesus said, he turns to his true followers and says unto them that a rich man shall hardly enter into the kingdom of heaven. Why did he say that? Because this man was concerned with his possessions and what he had more than he was sold out for Jesus. He was not willing to give up his great possessions in order to follow the Lord. And he was sorrowful, not that he grieved the heart of God, that he had to give up his possessions. That sorrow produced the death in the rich young ruler. Saul was disobedient. Towards the Lord, I want to talk about this. Saul was deceived that he did right by God. God told Saul this. The Lord sent me on a journey and said, go utterly destroy the Amalekites and fight against them and they, and until they be consumed. God gave Saul a direction that he said, listen, I don't want anything left in your heart at all. I want the enemy and sin to be completely consumed. I want you to continuously give up everything that I ask you. Consume the enemy. Don't quit until it's all gone. And wherefore did thou obey the voice of the Lord, but didn't fly upon the soil and didn't evil in the sight of the Lord? And Saul said unto Samuel, I have obeyed the voice of the Lord, and I have gone the way the Lord has sent me, and I brought back King Agag, and I brought back the Amalekites. But that's never what God said. God, God didn't tell Saul to bring back the spoil and bring back the king. He said, kill everything that stands between me and you. But he was genuinely deceived. We can make ourselves believe we're following God and that that direction is okay. When God is saying, I want to consume everything that separates me and you. Don't quit until it's all gone. And he said, behold, to obey is better than sacrifice. Listen to this. This is a strong word. He says, for rebellion is a sin of witchcraft. And stubbornness is a sin of iniquity and idolatry. Because thou have re rejected the word of God, he has rejected you from being king, and his kingdom was torn from him. Saul was tormented because he had a sorrow that led to death. When we're doing the wrong thing, God will allow our minds to be tormented. He'll allow our hearts to be tormented. Now there's another side where the enemy just keeps coming in. So it's our job to find out, God, is there anything between me and you? Have I followed you and obeyed your voice in all accounts? Is there anything I've held back that you've asked me for? Because the Holy Spirit will be, when you seek truth, truth will be revealed. Right. When you seek light, light will be revealed. 
When you knock, it will be open unto you. And the last one I want to talk about is Judas. Judas would betray Jesus. And the word of God said that he sought for an opportunity to betray Jesus. I'm talking about a God, a, I mean, a worldly sorrow that leads to death. Because Judas, when he got found out, he went back to, to the Pharisees and gave back the money and said, he said, I, I repent. He repented in front of man. But there's no revelation that he repented to God. See, we can go say we're sorry to so and so and such and such. But the Bible said against him and him only have I sinned. So we have to make sure that we repent before God. But remember, repentance is an action word. It's a change of direction. And you know what I feel about Judas? David knew that his God would forgive him. I don't think that Judas felt that God could forgive him. I felt that Judas probably was so condemned that he felt like I'm too far gone. The only way is for me to commit suicide. That's running rampant in the church. We people don't understand that God is a forgiving God and a gracious God and God wants to forgive and give you power to overcome and that we need to repent unto salvation. And that God would have forgave Judas. He would have. But Judas allowed his, his guilt and his shame to lead him to death. Don't allow your guilt and your shame and the verdict of guilty to lead you towards death and to keep going without God. Allow, repent, change directions, and allow the power of God to move in our life. Against him and him only, Naya, if you would come up, have I sinned? And he says this, I know this was long, but it's needful. For observe this very thing. That means cons conform one's actions and practices to. What is God telling us to conform our actions and practices to? That you sorrow in a godly manner. What diligence it produced in you. That means that God is about to mend the breach between him and you. God is about to mend the breach between him and you. It says, what clearing of yourselves, what cleansing comes and freedom comes and peace comes when we're no longer in controversy with God, but we admit our wrong and give it to him. A cleansing and freedom will come. What indignation, he says. What fear that God will judge our mistakes and we have a respect for that. But it says it creates a vehement desire, a longing to heal my relationship with God. I long to heal my relationship with God. And then it says what zeal, that zeal will be produced in you to do God's will. I am determined to right my wrongs. And I... And I will be innocent and I will be cleansed because of the blood of Jesus. Repentance leads to justification. A not guilty. I am cleansed by the blood of Jesus. I am changed by the blood of Jesus. And I receive his freedom and his peace and his power to overcome.